right? So thank you so much yes. for joining. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hear your talk. Thanks, Daphna. I'm going to put my presentation up. One moment, please. So it should begin sharing my screen in a moment here. Great, and let me start the presentation. Hi everyone, I'm Flarney, as Stephanie said, and I'm so excited to be here to talk with you about React and TypeScript. Just to introduce myself, I am a, currently a staff engineer at a company called Chegg. We build educational software. And I had the good fortune of previously working on the React core team at Facebook and other teams at Facebook. So I've had many years of React experience, and I've also been working with TypeScript, and I'm excited to share my insights from that experience with all of you. Today, I'm going to be talking with you about how to build a React app using TypeScript. This is an introductory talk with a focus on the differences between using vanilla JavaScript and using TypeScript with React. I'm going to be showing you all the steps you need to get started and do this yourself. I would invite you to save or write down any questions you have, and I'll be saving time at the end to do questions and answers. So you might be wondering, why should I learn TypeScript and React? What is the benefit of what we're about to do for the next hour. Because this is a React meetup, I'm guessing most of you are familiar with the benefits of React. React allows us to break our user interface into re small reusable components, and React gives us a declarative style to write our user interface code, typically more maintainable and easier to work with than an imperative style of coding. When we add TypeScript, on top of React, it reduces the number of bugs we run into and the number of type errors. Now, again, I think most of you are familiar with React, but just in case anyone is new to React, wanted to have one slide going over the basics that you'll need to know in order to follow the rest of this discussion. So the code on the left is code for a React component. This is going to give us one piece of our user interface. And we can see on the right, the piece that this component renders is a div that contains the text, hello, Taylor. And we can change it to say, hello, you, or hello, anything. So what makes this a React component is the part where we return that stuff with the angle brackets, where it says open div, hello, this.props.name, and close div. That angle brackety syntax is called JSX. And we'll talk a bit about that in a few slides. But this is something that is kind of a core part of React is we use JSX to actually put the markdown into our JavaScript or TypeScript. And then at the bottom, we can see we're using React DOM dot render. And this actually updates the DOM to show the component that we're describing with our JSX. Last, I wanted to mention props. So you can see we're saying hello this.props.name. So props is a JavaScript object with key value pairs that let us pass in data that is configurable for our React component. So we've had a super fast intro to React components. What's probably more important to cover is what is TypeScript? I know many people are more familiar with JavaScript and, and maybe have only heard about or just started to try TypeScript. So to understand, understand TypeScript, we need to understand that JavaScript is loosely typed. This means that JavaScript does not care what type of thing we assign to a variable or pass in to functions or return from functions. So in this example, we have a logger function is going to log something, whatever argument we give it. And we're calling the logger function with a string, a number, a function, nothing at all, and null. 
The author of a logger function probably did not intend for us to call it with a function or with nothing at all. I'm sure they intended us to log something and probably they want us to log a message or a string. So in your mind, try and run this code and imagine what is going to happen. Will there be an error? Is JavaScript going to have any problems? So in fact, JavaScript does not care. JavaScript will do the best that it can with whatever type of thing we give it in most cases. So it, uh, when we give it a function, it just prints out function, a function, maybe helpful, maybe not. When we give it undefined or nothing, it just kind of prints out nothing, as we can see. So JavaScript is loosely typed. We can compare this to other languages, like C++, for example, that are more strict about types. So in this example, we have this function, and the part being edited at the beginning is a type. It's telling C++ what type of thing this function is returning. And then we can see on line 5, this function returns 0, which is an integer. So when the type is set to int for integer, the code runs fine. And when I change the type to float, which stands for floating point number, that's pretty similar, right? They're both numerical types of things. But even that small change causes an error. And C++ will let us know. And I think this code would not even run until we get the correct types in place. So I would also compare TypeScript to JSX in terms of the way that it works. So to explain a bit about JSX, I'm borrowing this beautiful diagram from a talk by Maggie Appleton. So credit to Maggie Appleton. Uh, but we could think of JSX as a topping on top of the vanilla ice cream of our plain vanilla JavaScript. It's something extra that we're adding on top. The catch is that the browser still does not understand JSX. We can add whatever we want to a language, but that does not change what the browser understands. So we make this work by sending our code with the JSX in it through a processor, usually Babel. And that kind of translates all of that topping and it kind of takes it out and turns it into vanilla JavaScript on the other side. So then that vanilla JavaScript is what the browser can run. So in my, uh, my more abstract, quickly thrown together diagram, you can hopefully follow that there's a similar process that happens with TypeScript. TypeScript is adding on a topping to vanilla JavaScript where it adds in a type system, where it's checking types similar to other languages like C++. And this is still not valid in the browser. So then we run that code through a process, usually the TypeScript compiler, and that gives us the vanilla JavaScript on the other side. It takes out all of the stuff related to the type system. So now we understand how TypeScript works. I wanted to share the story of how my current team started using TypeScript. So this was before I joined the team. There was a different tech lead. And they were starting a new project. And the tech lead proposed to the team. He said, we should decide. Are we going to use TypeScript for this project? And all the engineers on the team voted no. They said, no way. This will take too long. It's too much to learn. And, and they all objected. They did not want to use TypeScript. And the tech lead overruled them. He said, too bad. I'm the tech lead. I know this is a good choice because it will help us avoid type errors. And so we're using TypeScript. And, and the engineers accepted this decision. They moved forward. And then a few months later, after they had been building a React app with TypeScript, they, these same engineers were interviewing me to join the team as their new tech lead. And, and they asked me, they said, what do you think of TypeScript? And I said, well, I think having a type system is, is useful. So TypeScript is fine. Uh, that's, that's cool with me. And they said, oh, good. We love TypeScript. They had completely changed their minds during the time that they had been using TypeScript. And this is an, 
uh, sentiment that I've heard from engineers across teams and across companies. They say, I hated TypeScript when I first tried it, but now after using it, I love it. So why is it that people end up loving TypeScript? So if you have programmed with JavaScript before, you've probably seen an error like this sooner or later, something like undefined is not a function. And to give another example in a little more depth, in this example, we have a function called create ice cream factory, and it will return for us another function that creates ice cream, right? It's a creator of ice cream factories, and we have to give it a flavor of ice cream that that new factory will create. There are a set of supported flavors, and what what is not obvious about this function is that if the flavor is not supported, it will return undefined. It will not give us a factory in that case. So an innocent developer comes along and calls create ice cream factory with a flavor that's not supported. So we think my factory is a function, but what is it really? In this case, my factory is undefined. JavaScript on its own will not warn us about this. And when we try to call it as a function, we get an error because we've hit a case that JavaScript really doesn't know what to do. So how does TypeScript solve this problem? This is a screenshot of a REPL where I'm running TypeScript with the same code example. We can see that TypeScript has analyzed this code. I really didn't change much about it and TypeScript can determine that I create ice cream factory could return undefined. So because that is a possibility, TypeScript is warning us about the possible bug that we will run into. It says we cannot call this as a, as a function because it might not be a function. So TypeScript prompts us to fix those bugs before they actually get into production. And this is the big selling point of TypeScript for me. No more type errors makes things go much smoother. I'd rather catch those errors early in the coding process. So now that we understand React, we understand TypeScript, how would you actually start a project using React and TypeScript? I'm going to go over three different ways. And I would invite you to follow along if, if you'd like on your own machine. So uh, I'm going to talk about two of the ways just to keep things moving. And then I will actually walk through one of them. And you're, oops, you're welcome to follow along. So I'm going to share this URL in the chat. And then we will actually step into uh, some running some commands, doing some things in the terminal. So I would invite you to go to this URL. I'm going there now. You can see this little repository has the directions for setting up React and TypeScript in three different ways. So as I said, I'll talk about two of the easiest ways, and then we'll actually step through the third way. So to start with, the easiest way to start any React application with or without TypeScript is to use create React app. There are only two steps here, so I won't demonstrate. It's, it's pretty simple. You just run the create React app script with the template flag set to TypeScript, and then you start your app. Now, if you want to try this yourself, I added a few troubleshooting tips, but really there's, there's not much to say. It's pretty simple. So that's create React app. And then similarly, there's another approach called using something called Next.js. Again, only two steps. We run a script to create our application and we go into that file. And with Next, to set up TypeScript, we install the dependencies for TypeScript. And then we rename the main JavaScript file to use the TypeScript extension. And then we restart our application. And when we restart the application running in development mode, 
Next, we'll detect that we made those changes to add TypeScript, and it will finish turning this into a TypeScript application. It will give you some default configurations and uh, finish the setup for you. So again, I won't demonstrate because it's dead easy, but you have the instructions here, and feel free to try that on your own. Now, Create React App and Next.js both use Webpack under the hood. Webpack is a build tool for JavaScript. So this one, I think, would be the most interesting for us to demonstrate and maybe walk through. It's how do we set up React and TypeScript using Webpack? And I'll talk more about the trade-offs of these while things are installing. But let's, let's start stepping through these steps. There's, you pretty much just copy-paste things from this guide. So we start by copying this line. Uh, we want to make a directory for our new project. So I made the directory. Then we want to CD into that directory. So we're changing our location, moving into that directory. We need to initialize NPM. And then we need to install a whole bunch of dependencies. So will you, I would copy paste this line and this will take a minute. So while these install, I'm going to quickly cover the trade-offs between these three approaches. Now create React App is the simplest approach to get started and it also has some limitations. Create React App is not designed to be configurable. So it gives you a default boilerplate and then when, whenever you hit a point where you want to customize any of the configurations, for example, the Webpack configuration, you would eject, and then it turns into kind of a Webpack build. It's, it's no longer Create React App, and you cannot pull updates from the Create React App project anymore. With Next.js, I would say there are more options for configuring your project down the road, but it also gives you reasonable defaults you still might run into cases that are not supported because you know it's it's designed for a certain use case and next.js is a really good choice when you want to set up server side rendering so i'd say that's that's the case that it's optimized for it's possible to opt out of it but i i would say it's not super easy so those are the trade offs and webpack setting it up on your own you have complete control but you have all the responsibility of maintaining the configurations, the dependencies, et cetera. So let's install our production dependencies. So React and React DOM, that will take another couple seconds. Then we're going to make two directories, one called source and one called dist. The source directory is where we will write our code that has the JSX and TypeScript. Now remember, that has to go through a process and get turned into vanilla JavaScript. So the dist directory is where we will put that vanilla JavaScript that comes out of that process. And those directories could be named anything, but these are the conventions commonly used for naming them. We're going to create an index file, which is index.html. It's just the home page of our app. And we're going to create an index TypeScript file and an app React component. So just a very basic setup. So to fill out the index.html, I'm going to open this project in Visual Studio. So let me just find it really quick here. Code, we just created this, so it's at the top. Great our index.html file, you can just paste in this. It is a basic HTML page. Next, we're going to uh, set up our configurations. So we need configurations, yeah, configuration files for Webpack and for TypeScript itself. Those are two parts of our build process. So I'm going to create a webpack.config file. I won't explain all of this right now, but it's uh, most basic configuration 
that you could have really for uh, this type of application. So again, imagine if we're using Create React App, Create React App or Next.js will do all of this for you under the hood. It's not a lot of steps, but it still is saving you time and you don't need to understand all of these configurations. Next, we're going to set our TypeScript configuration. And I will talk more, uh, I'll talk more about this later in the presentation, but let's create that file. So touch tsconfig.json, and then we can copy paste in a very minimal configuration here. Yes, config, and we've saved that. So we're almost finished. There are two more files that we need. We need to fill out a React component that will be used to render the contents of the page. So we can copy paste again and save. And then in the index TypeScript file, there, there is where we call react-dom.render and actually render this onto the page. So we can copy that, paste it into index.tsx. And last of all, we can add a couple of helpful scripts to our package.json. Now package.json is the configuration for this as an NPM project. So any scripts that we add here, we can run using NPM or Yarn. So now that we've added our script, we've completed all the steps, let's test this out. And live demos almost always have some problem that happens. So we'll see if there's a bug or if this just works. So when I run yarn build, it's putting the code through that process we talked about where it will spit out some vanilla JavaScript that the browser can run. Ah, and then yarn start just opened this and it shows this is our app. I did not customize your name here. So that's what the component is rendering. So this, this is the more hands-on low level way to set up your app and, and this is what Create React App and Next.js are doing for you under the hood. So now we have three different ways that we can start a uh, React and TypeScript application. We know the trade-offs. So let's, let's get into how do we actually write React components using TypeScript. So I want to back up a moment and talk about a TypeScript concept that I think is, is useful to understand when we get into writing React components with TypeScript. So this is something called generic types, and I'm going to explain it with this example function. So this example function called identity, and it takes some argument and returns that same argument. So in TypeScript, we have to specify what the type is for arguments and for returning. So you can see we've put number here, arg colon number, that tells TypeScript that the type of the argument is a number and the colon number after that tells TypeScript that this function will return a number. And that works fine if we use this with a number. But let's say we want to use this function with any type of thing. Then it's not going to work when we say the type is number and we try to pass in a string. How can we get around this? Well, TypeScript has a type called any, and you might be tempted to use it for cases like this. And the problem is that when we add the type any, that pretty much turns off TypeScript. It means that TypeScript will no longer give us any warnings or checks about this function and its return value. So let's say we call our identity function with a string foo, and then the return value is also a string. If we try to pass that string into some other function that's expecting a number, then this TypeScript won't catch it. It could fail silently. It, it will introduce a bug and TypeScript will not be able to warn us because we just turned TypeScript off. So we want to avoid the any type. Instead, in this case, 
we can use this angle brackety syntax and tell TypeScript there's going to be some type. Let's call it T. And that type will be the use for the argument. And then that same type will be the return value. It could be a different type every time we call this function, but it will be some, some type that's the same for the argument and the return value. When we do this, uh, often we actually will write the type definition in the angle brackets when we call the function. But TypeScript can also figure it out in some cases. So here, when we call identity with a string, we get a string back. If we try to pass that string to some function that's expecting a number, TypeScript will give us a type error. And that's what we want. So whirlwind intro to generics, we will kind of come back to this as we look at a React component. So to step through the types for a React component, one of the most important types that you will be thinking about is the type for the props. Remember, props is a plain JavaScript object that can have key value pairs to configure your React component. So in this case, the props is an object with a key of title, and that could be a string. And our component is banner. So at the top, we define what's called an interface. And that is a TypeScript definition for specific shape of JavaScript object. This is our React component. And we're giving it the type react.function component. And in the angle brackets, this is the generic part, we are able to specify what the props are, what shape the props will have. So we always set the type of the props in these angle brackets. So the purple stuff here, this is all the TypeScript type. I'm going to skip a little bit and show that then inside of our component, we can use props.title. And TypeScript knows that that is part of the props. So it won't complain. But if we misspelled title or we wrote props.label instead, TypeScript will warn us and say that's not part of the props. So you might notice we're also using props.children. That is not part of our interface at the top. So how does TypeScript know that this is allowed? So the short answer is that when we use the react.function component type, this special type gives TypeScript that information. It says that there will always be an option to use props.children. So this is how it all looks together. Not that different from writing a React component with vanilla JavaScript. We're just adding the information about the types. So this is the second uh, kind of mini exercise. And I would invite you again to follow along. For this one, it's the same repository. So I'll go back to that repository. And in this case, if you'd like to follow along, I would go to this repository and either clone or download it. So if you go to this page, there's this big green button. You can download the zip file and unzip it. Or you, if you know how to use git, you can git clone using uh, this URL. Then this mini exercise is in this directory using TypeScript with React. So when we cd into this directory, there's a guide. And there are just three steps. But we're going to walk through making your first React component using TypeScript. So the start, once you have this application, uh, sorry, this repository downloaded, is so we want to go into the My App project. It's a subdirectory in this project. So I'm going to go into that spot. I have, uh, have it already locally. So I'm going to cd into intro to React and TypeScript. And see there's a directory called using TypeScript with React. So I'm going to cd into that. And inside there, there's an app called My App. Now there's also My App Solution. So if you want to see the solution, that's there. But the one where we can fill it out ourselves is My App. Uh, and it looks like I had already installed the node modules. But just to demonstrate and to give you all time to do that, when you clone this, you will need to install 
the dependencies. So I'm going to myself remove the node modules and I'm going to run npm install. So once you kick off the installation of the dependencies, we can do step two while they're installing. So step two, this is one of the big tips that I hope you will take home from this, this uh, workshop is that whatever you, it, whenever you start a TypeScript project, you want to make the TypeScript configuration more strict. It's likely that whatever default you start with is not strict enough. So let's look at the TypeScript config in this project. So I'm going to open up my app inside of the using TypeScript with React project. And uh, so looking at this TypeScript config, one of the most important settings is strict being set to true. So luckily, this is a Create React app uh, TypeScript project, they already set strict to true. That gives us more warnings uh, and there's less possible errors that we can run into. So I'd also want to add these four settings. So let's copy those, just put those directly into compiler options. The first one, always strict, this is actually completely different from the strict setting we just talked about. This tells TypeScript to run our code in the JavaScript, JavaScript strict mode. So that's also important. No unused locals and no unused parameters tells TypeScript to warn us when we have any variables or parameters that are unused. And that's typically what we want. And then no implicit any. To summarize, this makes TypeScript strict and stops it from letting a certain errors sneak in. So we can save that. We've made our TypeScript config more strict. And looks like our dependencies are done running. So let's quickly start this up with, uh, you can do yarn start or npm run start, just to verify that things are working. And we're going to see the default start page that you get whenever you start a Create React app application. Great, so it looks like things are working. So we can do the last step, which is to uncomment a component inside of app.tsx and add the TypeScript types for that component. So if any of you got ahead, hopefully you've already had a chance to look at this, think about how you would fix the types. There's a couple of components at the top. So when I remove the comments on uh, lines, I think it was 4 and 22, then we get those two new components. And then inside of, kind of at the bottom, on lines 39, 43, there's a commented out section that will render this component inside of the app component. So we delete those lines 39 and 42 ish and save. Now we're rendering this new component called hello world and it has another component called warning text. Now I have a TypeScript plugin installed in Visual Studio and it's warning me about a problem here. It's pointing out that this interface hello world props does not exist. It can't find it. So that's the challenge for us, we need to write the interface for these props. And you can see the syntax in the TypeScript docs. It's just interface, and then the name that we want to give it. So hello world props, and then open close curly braces. So when I get that far, I've said right now that the props are an empty object, we can see TypeScript has a new warning for us or a new error. It says property name does not exist on props with children, hello world props. So the props with children part is the part that adds in children as an option. So we talked about that's something that uh, we get when we use this react function component type, but it's still telling us that name is not part of the props. So let's add name and that should be a string. So I'm gonna write string 
Now, well, TypeScript is not complaining. As you can see, props.children is valid. TypeScript is not erroring about that because we're using react.function component and that adds in that children property and adds in some other things too. Let's TypeScript know more details about what this is. So that was step three. We just kind of translated our component into TypeScript and I have the server, the dev server running here. So it should have restarted and uh, did it open in Chrome? Yes. So it refreshed automatically and we can see at the bottom our new component. Hello world. I did not, again, I did not fill in your name and a warning component that's rendering a warning. So now we've seen how to actually write React components using TypeScript. So going back to the learning part, The last thing that I wanted to sh show about React components in TypeScript is this is the definition of that type that we were using, react.function component. So this is a pretty complex type definition if you're starting out in TypeScript. So don't worry about understanding all the details here. But I think hopefully since we talked about generics, you can follow that P at the top is using a generic and it's letting us set any type that we want for the props. And then below, P gets passed to props with children and props with children defines the props as P, which is whatever we set, and the adding in the children as an optional attribute that is a React node. So it's, it's kind of cool to read through these definitions yourself. I won't explain them all, but I think it's, that's useful to understand is there's kind of custom TypeScript types for different libraries. So let's talk about some of the gotchas and best practices when you're building a React app with TypeScript. We were just talking about the react.function component type and there are other types to use specifically with React, react.component, react node, different types like that. And you want to use those types whenever, and whenever you have a third party library, there should be types written specifically for that library. I've seen cases where you pull in a library and TypeScript may not complain or it may not be totally obvious that you need to use these custom types but you always want to look for the types for that library. So speaking of looking for them, where would you find those types? So this is another true story. This just happened a few, oop, a few weeks ago. Uh, we, we were having a team discussion and we wanted to adopt a new library to use in our application. And someone asked, well, where are the TypeScript types? And typically TypeScript types are sort of a separate little library that you install to go with the third party library. So we looked in the repository and we did not see the TypeScript types there. And then we started Googling around and they weren't showing up. And I said, well, this, this is not looking good. Maybe we can't use this library. Nobody can find the TypeScript types. And luckily there's a very smart person on my team who went directly to definitely typed, which is a project in GitHub and said, I found them indefinitely typed. I was like, oh, thank goodness. Should have looked there first. So for almost any third party library that when you're looking for the types, they will be in this one project called definitely typed. That's where the TypeScript definitions for React are. You can find the TypeScript types for React Redux indefinitely typed and even libraries that may be more niche, like React text area auto size, you can find indefinitely typed. There are some rare cases where the TypeScript types are actually built into the main repository. So Apollo client is one of those examples. So if you don't find it in indefinitely typed, you might find it in the project repository, but look indefinitely typed and it's, it's a catch because it may not show up in a Google search, right? I mean, this is a project on GitHub. It has hundreds of different type definitions. Google does not seem to index it. So uh, 
look directly in the definitely typed repository. The next tip, we've already touched on this a bit, is that when you're setting up your TypeScript configuration, you want to make sure that it's strict from the start. I would recommend these four, the, yeah, these five settings. We've already talked about those. And it's hard to change them after you start your project and start writing code. If you go back and try to add settings that are more strict, you may get a bunch of errors that you need to fix before you can really enable that configuration, almost like linting settings. So start with the strictest possible setting is, is my view. And then this is probably the most important tip that I would share is uh, how to stop type leaks. So this is another true story of you know, when I first joined my team, they were about halfway finished building a React feature with TypeScript for the first time. And most of them were learning React for the first time, and we were all learning TypeScript. And it was very exciting. We thought, OK, we're getting close to launch, and we're using TypeScript in React. We're doing things with modern technology. We won't have errors. This will be great. And we were on a tight deadline. And so, of course, we did have some bugs that we had to fix as we were rolling out. And we had quite a few, in fact. And so afterwards, I thought, well, well, why don't we do an analysis of the root cause of these bugs and try to fix the root causes? And as you can see, the main, the, mo the most common root cause of bugs in our, in our feature launch was type errors. Ah, oh, that, oh, here. Uh, I pounded the keyboard and it skipped a couple slides. <laughs> it's really not expected, right? Because we were using TypeScript. I thought TypeScript would get rid of the type errors. Well, there are still a, some best practices that we need to follow to get the benefit of TypeScript and avoid those type errors. The main thing is to avoid the any type. And there are some other types. Uh, I've, the one I've seen most commonly pop up is object. And when, when you set these types in, in different ways, they turn TypeScript off. And they stop TypeScript from warning us about those type errors. So this allows type errors to creep into our application. So that's kind of a simple thing, easy to avoid once you know it. The more subtle thing to understand is that TypeScript checks types at compile time and not runtime. So remember when TypeScript was running through that process, it's at the point where it's running through that process and getting turned into vanilla JavaScript that the types are checked. And afterwards, when it's the browser is running our vanilla JavaScript, there are no more type checks. So this means that when our code is actually running and data comes in, like an API response or form data, or even uh, if, if we have a, an SDK and people are calling methods on our SDK, this means that that data is not being checked by TypeScript. So to go through a, a real example, let's say we are fetching some profile data from an API and we think we expect that there will be a first name and a last name that are both strings. So we write the code this way. We tell TypeScript those will both be strings. We pull them out. We're going to do something with them. But what the developer did not realize in this case is that last name could be undefined. So when we, and, and only in some cases, so maybe when we're testing this locally, it all works. But then in production, when last name is undefined, what will happen when we try to call car at on last name? You can see below we get an error. It's uh, Java, JavaScript is not able to call car at on undefined. So this is how we can still get a type error even when we're using TypeScript. So how do we fix this? With API data, we can set the type to unknown. And I would also make that API data optional using the question mark. So this tells TypeScript, we really don't know what this data is. We cannot trust what its type is. We can't tell you ahead of time. Uh, when we set the type to unknown, then when we try to call car at on last name, TypeScript warns us and says, hey, 
we can't call car ed on this because we don't know what type it is. So this forces us to check the types of any uh, value with the type unknown. And then you have to sort of, before you do anything like calling car ed, and uh, TypeScript will prompt us to add these checks. This way, those bugs don't sneak into production. We have to take, handle all the possible cases. Uh, so summary of what we've learned about TypeScript and React. Good, looks like we're right on time. So I would make sure to set your TypeScript config to be strict from the start. Then you should know where to find the types for React and other libraries and use those types. Spoilers, it's definitely typed. Next, I would validate all data types before they enter your application and use the unknown type to force that validation. And in general, if you're ever tempted to use the any type, I would use unknown instead. This should give us the benefits of TypeScript and React. So no type errors. We can skip writing manual type, type checks all through our code. Refactors become easier. And TypeScript acts as inline documentation that is always up to date. So thanks so much. We have about 10 minutes left. I'd be happy to take any questions or comments. And I'll... Uh, thinking I'll keep my slides up in case anyone wants to reference them. Let's see, I see at least one question in the chat. So Bruno asked, are there still advantages to using Flow instead of TypeScript? Oh, that's a great question. So Flow, for your knowledge, if, if you haven't heard of Flow, it's very similar to TypeScript and gives you a type system on top of JavaScript. I know there are differences, but I can say as someone who I've, I've used Flow and TypeScript extensively at work in a production setting, both of them. And for me as a user, I did not see much difference. The main difference that was meaningful to me is I don't think Flow has something equivalent of unknown. So I would miss that if I went back to Flow. Um, I haven't missed, yeah, I haven't missed anything about Flow compared to TypeScript. Uh, da, 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 John says, or sorry, Johan says, I usually destructure my component props and their set defaults. Also defining an interface feels like duplication. Sure, yeah, that's, uh, that's valid. There are different ways that you can write out the types for your TypeScript, your props in using TypeScript and React. That's fine. This is the way that I am habitually writing it. And I think so long as you're setting the types correctly and not using any, that's a good start. Any other questions? Ah. So uh, Johan is asking, validating all data types for all API responses in this manner will result in massive amounts of code. How can one do this in a neater manner? I'm glad you asked. I was hoping someone would ask that. So if we look at the example that I gave, this was a really oversimplified example to kind of give you the main idea. It's like here in this one place where we get the data, we're adding a check to see that it is the right type. Now, you're right. In a large application, this approach of you know hand validating each API response as it comes in, it would not scale. So what I would recommend in terms of architecture is look at your app and how the data is coming in and find one central place that we can kind of put the data through. It's like, this is our entry point. And there, I would use reusable validation code. Uh, you can write functions that validate things that are reusable. And TypeScript has something built in for uh, like reusable type checkers. So you could look into that. But for, use reusable type checking code and do it all in one place so that by the time the data gets into the application, it's already been checked. So. 
the, the one place, it's going to depend on the structure of your application. Uh, one possible approach, let's say you're building a React Redux application, is uh, you could add a validator for all actions. It's typically, when data comes in, we, set, we update the store by sending an action. So if we have validation for actions, they all flow through one uh, either middleware or, well, yeah, I think a middleware or something on the reducers, you know, one check, then, then you, you would feel a bit safer about that data. Let me catch up on any questions. But, uh, it feels slow on large projects. I, I think I think I would be curious to hear why it feels slow for me on a large project. TypeScript lets me move much faster because that's when I'm often doing a refactor of one piece of code that's used in 10 or 20 other places. And it may not be as simple as a search to those places because it could be renamed and then passed somewhere else. So TypeScript pretty much gives me, it like holds my hand and walks me through that update. If I change a function so that its argument type is, a, is an object instead of a string, then TypeScript will give me a list of warnings for all the places that need updated. Uh, so Daniel said, thank you for the great introduction. Oh, thank you for listening. How does the compile time type checks play with a document database with fairly soft typing like MongoDB. Lots of undefined or other good tricks. That's that's an interesting question. So so I have not you know worked with that type of case. I'd be curious if anyone else wants to chime in, but it sounds like the issue is that the API data might might be unreliable. They said if there's lots of undefined. I mean, that that's why I would add the checks to make sure that the data is there before trying to use it for anything. Ah, and Daphna asks, and thank you again for hosting me, Daphna, um, and David. She said, have you worked on a project where you slowly added new components in TypeScript while originally the project was in JavaScript? If so, would you say it's hard, easy? If hard, what are the main pain points? So I've seen some teams start to do this. Uh, it, it, it's not hard, but what's hard is that you won't fully get the benefits of TypeScript until you've really made progress in converting your code base. I mean, you will get some type checks, but really the only part that is protected from those type errors is whatever part you've converted. So if we've updated 10% of our code, 90% still could have type errors. And so, so that's probably the hardest part is just making progress and, and also, you know, teaching people these best practices so that, you know, you start things in the right way. Um, yeah. And then I, I've seen, uh, I would recommend Airbnb just published a post and released a whole tool set of code mod tools for working with large projects that are not in TypeScript and converting them to TypeScript. So I haven't had a chance to play around with those yet, but that looks really promising. <laughs> Will you add TypeScript to your side project as well? Uh, to be honest, I have, I have not update, you know, I don't always go back and update old side projects. So if it's an old project, probably not. And for a long time, my side project was maintaining the Draft.js framework, and that is already, you know, it uses Flow. I assume it still uses Flow because that's what Facebook uses. So, I, but yeah, I, so I'm not expecting the main repository to have TypeScript types. Are there situations, Marcus asks, are there any situations where the any is a good type to use or is it just something that lazy team members use when they don't know what to type? There is one case where I would allow the any type, and that is in unit tests. In unit tests, we often are working with mock data and mock functions, and those may not strictly follow the real types that are expected in our TypeScript definitions. 
So in, t in test settings, I will use the any type sometimes, just like if we're mocking out a huge API response and we only need a couple of fields, I don't see any reason to be type checking that so long as we know that the test is correct. Oh, and thanks David for sharing the Airbnb post. So they have released these great code mod tools for transforming your vanilla JavaScript legacy app into a TypeScript application. We're just about at time. Uh -huh. Is there any wrap up or anything we need to do, Daphna and David? Um, not really. Um, I don't know, maybe David wants to say something, but I just wanted to say again, thanks a lot for meeting with us today. Absolutely. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, last thing someone asked about TypeScript best practices, the TypeScript docs are a good place to start. And yeah, that's, that's where I would start. OK, thanks, everyone. Thank you. It was a great, uh, great talk, I think. Uh, and really interesting with the code mods. I didn't see them because we are actually in the process of like migrating a lot of stuff to, uh, to TypeScript. So might actually be go. really handy. Bruno, what do you think? You're here somewhere, I think. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. oh, I'm, looking at the, I'm looking at the article right now. <laughs> yeah, very, very interesting. Yeah, we didn't see that before. So very, very happy about that. So yeah, I want to thank our sponsors, uh, Universal Avenue. And uh, uh, if you want to work with TypeScript and convert large projects to TypeScript, uh, you can go to careers.universalavenue.com and you might find something. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much and for, for joining us. And uh, until next time, we'll see everyone around. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye.